There are finally budget CPUs available, and they're from 2020, but worth looking at. If you are trying to build a gaming computer for as cheap as possible, it's finally starting to look like a pretty good time for that. The Intel i3-10100 is back on the bench today. We haven't looked at it for about two years, and the landscape was entirely different. We're going to be comparing the 10100 versus the newly priced reduced 12100F, which is now closer to $107 or so, dollars, much better value even than what it already was and against some of the closest AMD competition. So this will be a good set of benchmarks for you if you're trying to build a budget gaming PC or help someone build one while spending as absolutely little as possible and still getting a good system for a couple years. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Thermaltake Tower 100. Thermaltake's Tower 100 is a mini ITX case to serve as a showcase system for your components. The Tower 100 has received many revisions since we first saw it, and the case now has an open vent in the bottom for intake, a mesh cutout in the side panel for some GPU ventilation, and additional mesh along the side skirts and the side panels of the case. The Tower 100 is mostly focused on building a showpiece PC that's small enough to fit on most tables. Learn more at the link in the description below. So the two CPUs we're looking at mostly today are right here. The 12100F is one of them. The 10100, you might remember if you've at least been active for a couple years in the industry, but uh, the 10100 has a few variants just like all the other Intel CPUs where there's the 10100F, which does not have integrated graphics, and then there's the 10100 that does have an IGP, and the IGP doesn't provide a lot of value outside of quick sync and maybe some troubleshooting capabilities. But you can save some money without the IGP, as always with the Intel CPUs and the AMD CPUs to some extent. So uh, for the 10100s, right now what we're looking at is about $80 for 10100F from what we just checked online, and the 12100F is now down to 107 from when we bought it. We paid about 120, 130 when we first reviewed it. And the R5, 4500 and up, it starts about $130. So much higher price there. The next most interesting CPU to consider would be the Pentium G7400. And the motherboard's moving. And back when we reviewed that CPU, the market at the time, we hadn't looked at the 10100 in quite a while. And there were no other cheap Intel options yet, at least none below $100. So the G7400, we kind of looked at it like, well, it kind of works. It's, it's OK. But it's not a great experience. We don't really feel comfortable recommending it because of the thread limitations at two cores, four threads. That is actually starting to become a problem now where, yes, there's a lot more to a CPU than cores and threads, but there is kind of a baseline minimum. And the 7400 barely hits it for some games, but really starts to struggle with other types of games. So uh, the 10100 it comes in as a similarly priced option. It's maybe $12 more or something like that. And potentially far better. The biggest thing you need to remember with the 10 series is that with the non-K CPUs, you couldn't overclock the memory unless you had a Z series board, which is a colossal waste of money when you're trying to spend as little as possible on a CPU. So you basically were in a scenario where you're probably guaranteed to be running max maybe 2666 for the memory, DDR4 2666, whereas DDR4 3200, offers anywhere from 15 to 20 plus percent uplift, depending on the scenario, and all your changes is the memory, not even the CPU, but also the motherboard, because otherwise you can't get those higher speeds, even if it's just XMP. So to quickly go over specs, the 12100F, just as a reminder, compared to the 10100, we'll show here, uh, it's four cores, eight threads on the 12100F. That is the same as the 10100, but the 12100F moves to what Intel calls Intel 7, or it's 10 nanometer process effectively, versus 14 for the 10 series. And with this move, Intel also introduced P cores and E cores. The 12100, though, only has P cores, so that makes that simple. The frequencies are the same for boosting, the 4.3 gigahertz, but the architecture is different, so that sort of manifests itself a different way. The base frequency is 3.3 gigahertz on the 12100F versus 3.6 base on the 10100, but it's, again, older architecture there. 12 megabytes of cache for the 12100F versus 10100's 6 megabytes of cache. 5 megabytes of the cache on the 12100 is L2. And then from memory, 12100F introduces DDR4 3200 as a cheaper option. You don't have to go DDR5, although you, you could, but again, massive waste of money for the budget class. And PCIe Gen 5 on the 12100 uh, and only 3.0 on the 10100. However, that doesn't actually matter because you're not going to be bound by the PCIe bus or the interface on these lower end CPUs because you're probably not spending that much on a GPU where you're buying something that can even really come close to leveraging PCIe 3.0 by 16. 
So don't need to worry about that much. Uh, the PCIe lanes are different. You get 20 on the 12100F versus 16 on the 10100. So a little bit more room there for NVMe. But ultimately, those are the key differences other than price. The 12100F, we liked a lot for the value. It is the best value gaming CP right now. 12400 is a very good competitor. But the 12100F is sort of our bottom line. Like This is where you can get into a gaming PC without spending a lot. And you'll be set for a couple of years. Not like you're cutting off a bunch of features like you do with a Pentium. Anyway, enough of that. We're going to get into the testing here. This is a revisit. So we re-ran the 10100 through all of our tests. When we first reviewed it, we actually didn't like it that much. It was OK, but we said it was hard to justify versus AMD's R33300X. And remember, those came out about the same time. But the 3300X has mostly vanished from the market. So it's irrelevant today. We're looking at this in a new light. We are only considering the scope of how it performs today, and we don't really care about the history of the 10100 because it's much cheaper now at $80, and that's what makes it interesting. So let's get started with some tests. We'll look at 2066 and 3200 for the memory speed. In Counter-Strike Global Offensive, one of the easier titles to run in our bench suite, the i3-10100 CPU with DDR4-3200 ran at 186 FPS average. That had it about tied with the R7-2700X. Meanwhile, AMD's $130 R5-4500 that we actually genuinely forgot existed leads the 10100 by 3.2% in average FPS, with lows overall indistinguishable to the player. More realistically, you'll be on DDR4-2666, though, for the 10100, which runs at 162 FPS average in our test in here. That allows the 3200 variant a huge 15% lead and it has the new G7400 ahead, which costs about the same, although it will have thread problems later, as you'll see in some other games. As for the new i3 CPUs, the 12100F ran at 251 FPS average, leading the 10100-2666 by 48%, or the 3200 option by 35%. That is also a massive lead in either case, and the 12100F's 26% price hike isn't even that bad for the performance gain. The $107 12100F may be worth considering as an alternative, but some people probably won't be able to get past that extra $20 or so, and that's totally fine. If you're on a strict budget and you have no dollars to spare, then the 10100 and more realistically the 10100F are still strong performers and they're more than capable here. In the very least, they're better value than the $130 R5-4500. The RAM is clearly a little more limited. At 1440p, the 10100 is about the same as before. That's expected. We're entirely CPU bound, so the stack doesn't shift much, except maybe a bit at the top. Value remains consistent with before. It's fully capable at 1440p and at least this title, as long as the GPU is also capable. Cyberpunk is a much harder game to run on these CPUs. The realistic 10100 ran at 101 FPS average, that's the one with 2666, and that allows the DDR4-3200 variant a staggering 20% uplift just by moving to that faster speed of memory. RAM really does matter when you're looking at games and things that are latency bound or memory bound, obviously, and here we do start to see that difference. The 100 FPS result has it below the R5-4500, but the R5-4500 is itself embarrassingly below the 10100 with faster RAM, even in spite of the R5's own DDR4-3200, the same timings, and the $130 price tag. The 10100 with DDR4-3200 is, again, about tied with the 2700X and the R5-3600, with the 12100F leading by 17%, or about 40% over the 2666 variant. The 12100F maintains its position as best overall value in the current generation, and it holds a massive lead. But for an ultra-budget, sub-$100 option, the 10100 remains capable. It's at least far better than the Pentium G7400 here, which drags down at 72 FPS average and struggles with thread count. We'll look at another hard one to run. In Far Cry 6, the G7400 is the lowest performing relevant CPU at 70 FPS average, with the 10100, 2666 that is, leading by 22%. The DDR4-3200 option ran at 98 FPS average, about tied with the R5-4500 and the 2700X gains. As for value versus modern parts, the 12100F keeps our recommendation if you can afford that extra $20 to $30. However, as a gaming CPU that just sort of gets the job done and doesn't do much else, the 10100 or 10100F remain fine options. The down-to-earth look is that you'll get a few more years yet on the 10100 with games that are on the lower end of the CPU load spectrum, but the 12100F will last you uh, probably a little bit longer than that, and it'll be a better experience. It's just, if you can't afford it, you still get a good experience with the 10100. 
As for the 4500, that at this point should just be ignored. It's $30 more expensive than the 1200F and not even close in performance or value. On to the easier games to run. Rainbow Six Siege has the 2666 10100 at 311 FPS average. Is that enough numbers for you in that space of time? This allows the 3200 option a lead of 16%. In either case, though, the 10100 is a better choice than the Pentium G7400 when evaluating strictly the cheapest possible gaming glass CPU. We'll ignore the 4500 and 5500 for being relatively embarrassing when compared to the 12100F at 421 FPS average and leading the 10100s by 35% and 17%. It's still the better option, but the 10100 CPUs are more than capable here and a better value than other sub $100 CPUs we've tested. In F1 2021, also easy to run, the G7400 set the floor other than the less relevant Celeron at 158 FPS average. This makes the 10100 a good value again for its minimum lead of 34%. The slower 10100 even is still the best of the budget CPUs on this list strictly in terms of cost, while the 12100F maintains the best overall value if you can stretch that price. And the uplift is noteworthy. It's 42% versus the more realistic RAM pairing with the 10100, or 20% versus the DDR4-3200 option if you have a Z-series motherboard for that generation. GTA 5 gives us something older to test, which is useful for more limited core count configurations. The 10100 2666 ran at 85FPS average, leading the G7400 slightly, but not noticeably. The bigger value here is that the Pentium had issues in some games with frame time consistency due to thread count, but the 10100 doesn't encounter those same issues. The 3200 variant only gains 11%, showing less relevance here, and it trails the less relevant 4500 and R5-3600. Well, that's not entirely fair. The R5-3600 is still relevant, but the R5-4500 was never relevant. The story is the same here as before, though. We'd recommend the 1200F, but you'd be happy enough on a 10100 on a tighter budget. 1440p doesn't change anything, but we thought we'd just show the proof here. The bind is on the CPU, so the results are the same and the lineup remains consistent to the top. In Total War Three Kingdoms at 1080p, the 10100 ran at 123 FPS average with 2666 memory in our test scenario, outpacing the G7400 by 12%. The lows are paced consistently between the 10100 and the G7400 here, so there's really no meaningful difference in 1% 0.1% in terms of scaling. The R5-4500 finally has a good lead here, at about 26% ahead of the 2666 option of the 10100. However, the 12100F leads the 4500 by 21% and is nearly $30 cheaper, and its lead over the 10100 with 2666 is 53%. That's huge. Finally, for the last one for games, Red Dead Redemption 2 tells a familiar story, except the 10100 lead over the G7400 is far greater this time, at 39% even in the worst case scenario. This really highlights the thread deficit of the G7400 despite being able to hold up in other games. We'll keep production benchmarks short since they're not that important for this price class. We'll start with the 3D animation modeling software Blender. We use this for our own product designs internally, like for the 3D drink coasters that we make and that are available on store.gamersnexus.net if you'd like to get something really cool and unique in exchange for also helping us out. Here we use the Cycles Renderer to render out the GN logo using only the CPU and spawning one tile per thread. The 10100 required about 46 minutes to complete the render, regardless of which memory kit was used. The RAM doesn't always matter. Here, we're more bound by threads than anything, and then frequency after that. The 12100F holds a massive lead at 32% time reduced versus the 10100s. The 4500 actually does better here, at about 19% reduced further from the 12100F. The Pentium is basically unusable in this kind of work. The 10100s nearly have its render time requirement, so if you might occasionally dabble in professional software like this, we'd urge you to just avoid the Pentium CPU and buy up. You could probably try and figure out how to make it work, cut the dollars from somewhere else in the build, it's worth it. At least the 10100 can kind of do this. We test Adobe Premiere by aggregating results of scrubbing playback, rendering, filters, transforms, warps, things like that, and then we score them all using the Puget software suite. The 10100 ran at 461 to 491 points, allowing the 12100F an advantage of 28% at its best. The 4500 leads this too, although it gets somewhat embarrassed by AMD's own 3600 ahead of that. This is our last production test. In Adobe Photoshop, tested the same way as Premiere, the 10100 scored 566 to 688 points, a much wider range for a production tool than before, and the result of the 
memory change here is more meaningful. This is an instance where, if you're going to be working with Photoshop regularly, it would probably be worth the extra $20 to go up a class. Power consumption is last and very simple. Here, the 10100 remains the lowest consuming CPU we've tested when testing at the 12 volt rails at 52 watts under full load after Intel Tau expiry. The R5 4500 is far more efficient at the same power consumption, and the 12100F is more efficient than both, at least outside of something like Blender. Regardless, you won't really need much of a power supply for any of these three CPUs, which is great because you can save some more money there by reducing the capacity of the power supply. Now with benchmarks done, a little bit of help for those of you who are considering these CPUs on motherboard selection. Uh, you'll need to more carefully consider your motherboard choices with the 10 series than with the newer 12 series or with AMD CPUs because there are a lot of features that get turned off. And you're trying to build a system as cheap as possible, and it's really not bad to get a $65, $70 board where it's bare bones, it'll work, the VRM's probably not gonna blow up on a 10100, and, uh, and you get a good platform started for really cheap. The B560 boards were as cheap as $70. Both of these support 10100s, and you shouldn't need to worry about BIOS flashing because Z the 500 series is newer than the 400 series. And the Z490 is $130, which would get you the memory unlocked to get those 3,200 numbers that we saw on our benchmarks. But you're spending so much more money for an older platform for an i3. It feels terrible to buy into that. And we like to take our reviews from the approach of like well-grounded, not just ESD, but well-grounded uh, value of does this make sense for a consumer? And Z-Series, hell no, it doesn't make sense for an i3. It never did. So, and that was our biggest problem with the 10100 originally. So then you're looking at a 70-ish dollar motherboard, maybe scale up to 80 in this class. And any more than that, you really should just be looking at a 12100F instead and buying a cheaper board for that series, uh, which is going to be the 600 series if you're out of the loop on that. AMD is a strong competitor, just not here right now, not at this price class, unless you can maybe find something used like a 3600 for cheap on eBay. We haven't really looked at the pricing of that. But anyway, um, our recommendation, as we said throughout the chart, is still the 12100F gets a strong recommendation from us because we paid $120, $130 when it came out. Now it's $107, actually a crazy good value. But we also understand that it's not, it's easy to say for us, just spend an extra $20 and you'll get a way better CPU, which is true. You're anywhere from maybe 35%, sometimes 50% better performance in a 12100F than a 10100 with 2066. However, it's not that simple in real life because an extra $20 might not just be something you can just spend without much extra thought to it. So if that's the case for you, that's fine. The 10100 will get you by, we'd get the F version, not the IGP version with a cheap GPU. And that'll get you through gaming probably for a couple of years on sort of these lower end types of games. But once you scale into harder to run stuff on the CPU, like Hitman 3, for example, um, Grand Strategy or, or Total War style games, Civilization, stuff like that, where it's really CPU heavy on AI processing, you'll encounter some difficulties, but it still runs them today. We wouldn't really recommend the G7400 at this point. 10100 makes more sense than if you can stretch, absolutely the 12100F is worth it. So to answer that question, our, our choice is yes, the 12100F, if you can do the 20 bucks, absolutely. So that's it for this one. Kind of fun to look at older CPUs like this. Makes me want to do actually uh, some budget PC builds now that the prices are returning to normal and GPUs are getting more available at this point. Still need something on the low end, to accompany these CPUs, but the CPU space is well sorted out. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, happy to do some of this technical content. We've got more coming up for you, including some CPU coolers and power supplies. So subscribe for all that to learn more about components and what's good right now and also what's bad. We have a lot of those coming up too. And go to store.gamersaccess.net to grab one of our coaster packs or patreon.com slash gamersaccess for bonus videos. We'll see you all next time.